Now, you resigned on the 9th of July 2018, um, and uh, that was, just to put it in context for the sake of anybody watching this programme, um, uh, which is going to go out on the parliamentary channel, so I understand, um, that was, in fact, three days after the Chequers meeting on July the 6th, and just to remind people, that was literally only 10 days that was the 6th of July, it was 10 days after the Withdrawal Act uh, had been passed by the House of Commons um, and got royal assent on the, uh, on, the, on that day. So for practical purposes, for the 26th of June, uh, we have royal assent for an act which says that we repeal the European Community Act 1972 from Exit Day. Then, in a matter of days, we then have the Chequers arrangement. In the broadest terms, just so that we can sort of set the scene, what did you sort of feel when you saw all that happening and what was the sort of underlying thoughts that were going through your mind? Because this is partly personal, but it's also uh, very interesting for us to get a sense of what was really going on in your mind. Thank you, Sir William, and I very much appreciate this opportunity to give evidence, and I'm grateful to the whole committee. Um, you, of course, come to the heart of the matter, in particular in your connection to the passage of the EU Withdrawal Act, for which I was responsible in the Commons, and the, uh, my resignation not far after. Um, so, obviously, David Davis and I were very close to one another, and uh, it, it became apparent to me in the preceding week that the government was going to an adopt, adopt a policy for EU exit that I would not be able to support. Indeed, I declined a number of meetings in the preceding days um, because I felt I could not bear to go through the business of being persuaded to capitulate and support the proposals. I came to believe over the course of my time in government that one of the reasons I'd been made a minister was so when the moment came of capitulation I would be asked to sell it and of course I was not willing to do so. So uh, as we approached the Chequers um, debacle, uh, I, I, I felt aware of what was going to happen that we would have an EEA light style Brexit with a customs union light alongside it, which I was not willing to support. So it, was not a, it, would, it wasn't a particular surprise to me uh, when uh, Chequers happened. Um, I stayed close to David Davis, and when David decided to resign, I knew I was going to go uh, with him. Um, in a sense, uh, I tried to minimise the impact in the media by going at exa absolutely at the same time which meant, of course, I was a single line on the Today programme rather than the story. But uh, yeah. it was not the first time I'd considered resigning. I previously considered resigning over the failure of the government to make public no-deal preparation. I, could, uh, I very nearly resigned in March. I decided not to because of the passage of the EU Withdrawal Act. I felt that I could not responsibly resign before that Act had completed its passage. Thank you very much. Um, and, and again, has the Brexit process and the Brexit negotiations, in your view, had an impact on public confidence in, the de in democratic and parliamentary government? And if so, in what ways? And could you or could or should the government have done more to inform and explain to the public what it was all about? Well, Sir William, that is a huge question. I'd like, if I may, to answer it in, in two parts. A little about the strategic communication and a little about confidence in government. I vividly recall a conversation shortly after uh, Suella Braverman joined the department. I've asked to go back and look at the papers. But all the ministers came together in our conference room and were briefed on the kind of exit we could have. Either what I would characterise as a high alignment Brexit, something like the EEA plus something like the customs union, or a normal advanced free trade agreement. And after going to and fro through the briefing, all of the ministers in the department together decided that we wanted a normal advance free trade agreement because that would be the kind of Brexit which would fulfil the mandate of the referendum and indeed the mandate of the preceding speeches, the mandate of the general election. Our officials looked somewhat crestfallen. Clearly the advice was to go for a high alignment Brexit. And then subsequently, in a sense, the rest is, is history because... The European Union then offered us that kind of Brexit. President Tusk's offer on behalf of the Council included an advanced free can trade you, agreement. Can you give a sense as to what that date was, more or less? 
Uh, it will have, I think it was in February. Um, I've been back to my notes this morning. I can't find the exact date this morning. But I, as I say, I have, I have asked to go back to the department and uh, examine the papers. And I'll be happy to write to the committee uh, uh, and let you know, Sir William, exactly when that, when that happened. But what clearly happened subsequently, as David Davis uh, uh, explained in his evidence to the committee, is that we ended up with a parallel process of policy development. Within the department, ministers David, led by David Davis were developing one policy and the Cabinet Office Europe unit clearly developing another, which was revealed at Chequers. David, I think he's uh, attested that he had five days' notice. And it seems to me that this is a considerable abuse of our constitution. For a Secretary of State to be cut out of his main the development of his main policy is, is, is quite a debacle, and it seems that something similar happened to Dominic Raab as his successor. Can, can you sort of explain, um, in words which demonstrate uh, the sequence of events, uh, how you saw uh, this divergence of, of opinion and thoughts as between number 10 who was responsible, and also what was going on in the department. Because you're demonstrating at the moment that they were, they were picking up messages. You thought you might resign at an earlier stage, but you thought you'd better stay there because of the withdrawal bill. Mm. But there comes a time when you're conscious of the fact that you're operating in what appears to be different silos. Um, and that must have been quite an experience because, after all, as you quite rightly say, the Secretary of State is the person given the responsibility for carrying out the functions of Secretary of State and having to appear in the House of Commons to appear accountable. You're there with him and having to do a similar kind of job. Yes. So can you just sort of explain the relationship with Number 10? I mean, is it like a bunker, for example? <laughs> Not really worth it, <laughs> I think, Sir William, it's worth just restating the context. So my job was primarily domestic preparedness and legislation with some uh, English regional engagement, for example. Uh, and I was originally responsible as the junior minister for all legislation, and I handed over the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill to uh, Suella Braverman after she joined. So my responsibility... Can you speak a little bit more slowly, because you're saying course. some very important things. So my responsibility was mostly to get that act through, the EU Withdrawal Act, and to make sure that all departments were preparing properly for all exit scenarios. And that, of course, was all-consuming. My duties were therefore mostly UK-facing, not facing the negotiation. But, of course, on important papers, we would see... I wouldn't see all the papers, but I would see a good, a good number of the papers, in particular the summer policy papers which we produce. So they, they seemed, as I think the EU Commission has said, like applications to join. Now, the reason I mention this is, is that the constant refrain throughout the time, my time in government was this atmosphere of reluctance to leave. And I think this is at the heart of the problem. While we won the vote, we did not win the argument in, for what of a better term, for want of a better term I would call the governing class. So we've ended up with those who govern being forced to do that which they must to take us out but it's not that which they choose. And that suffuses the entire approach. The entire approach is suffused by a reluctance to deliver what the public wanted, which is us controlling our laws in our parliament with all that that means. So the relationship between number 10 and the Dexu ministers was always one of instinctive uh, tension, because I think it's fair to say, uh, as Mr Jones will know, that the Dexu ministers overwhelming are people, people who believe in exiting the European That's Union. He, he was a minister before you were. Indeed, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're ministers who believed in exiting the EU, whereas overwhelmingly the staff of number 10 seemed, for the most part, not to be people with a heart for it. And I think that that tension suffused the entire process and we were regularly overruled. So, for example, after President Tusk made his offer of security cooperation, participation in institutions of research, innovation, education and culture, dealing with absurdities, he mentioned flights, I would add a range of other things, driving licences, data and so on. He also offered an advance free trade agreement, all sectors, no tariffs, you, you know what he offered. Once he'd made that offer, I was very pleased because it matched the policy which Dexu ministers had decided and I wanted to start putting it in my speeches. And one speech in particular, I remember, was edited by number 10 to remove references to that offer because, of course, it was not the offer which 
the system as a whole wanted. So what I would say is that we were fine, uh, silos, silos is a good way to look at it, but it's silos not only in terms of policy, but also in terms of mentality. I take an expansive view of the world. I want us to be a, a country which is outward facing a, a global citizen, free trading with the world. But I think that many of those determining policy are so wedded to the European Union and this idea of integration for the purpose of free trade that they, they cannot face up to enthusiastically delivering the mandate that they have. And that has meant our entire negotiation has been fearful, conducted in a posture of supplication. It, it, it's, it, it's difficult to be too damning about the attitude that's been brought to the negotiation. But that's not to condemn the individuals who I feel sure are all doing their best in, uh, within their view of their duty to the nation. But unfortunately, they don't believe in what they're doing. So I, I, I'm afraid I view our current circumstances with considerable sadness. Right. Well, first of all, if I may, um, I'll ask Philippa Whitford and then Geraint Davis and then Richard. If I may, Sir William, I beg your pardon. I wanted to also, you asked me about explaining it, forgive me if I may. There was another issue. Back in in the autumn of 17, (coughs) after I joined, I wrote a paper on strategic communications, strongly encouraging the government to communicate what we were doing and, in particular, our no deal preparedness. And those suggestions were not taken up, again, by Number 10 because they did not want to have an impact on the negotiations, in case the European Union essentially did not like what we were saying. And, and, and this is just further to the point about reluctance suffusing the whole thing, I think. Right. Um, Philippa, just before that, just one last question I'd like to put in at this stage. At any point in your time as a minister, did ministers in your department come together to frame a collective view on the kind of Brexit they wanted to see? Absolutely, Sir William. In the meeting I described earlier, which I believe took place in February, but I will go back to the department and check, but it was certainly after Suella Bravman joined the department and before the Tusk offer. But in that period, we met collectively with officials and took a view that we should have an advanced free trade agreement-based trade relationship and not one of high alignment uh, of the kind uh, similar to the EEA. Right, Philip, please. Um, it, it almost follows on from that. At the start of the process, the Prime Minister said she would consult across the House, she would consult across the United Kingdom and come up with what Brexit looks like before going to Europe. Um, but she didn't really do that. And then going through, there was all the keeping cards close to the chest, which then touches on the, the communication. Do you think if more work had been done right at the start to work out across Parliament, across Government, across Cabinet, this is what we want and have agreement. We wouldn't have had, in essence, the public negotiations we've been having in this House over the last couple of months. Well, you you raise an extremely important point. Um, Before the Vote Leave campaign kicked off, I was extremely optimistic about our capacity as a nation to decide what we were doing, accept the result of a referendum and move forward together. Um, The Vote Leave campaign started with very high-minded. Dominic Cummings' uh, interview with The Economist, for example, I think stands the test of being a thoughtful interview, aware of the great geopolitical challenges, technological, economic challenges of our time. I think it was an interview anyone could be proud of. And then, of course, by the end of the Vote Leave campaign, we were putting out leaflets, helpfully showing where Syria is in relation to Turkey, and I was not very pleased about that. So when you ask that question, I think you you, you point to the overall dynamic because what I think we've discovered is that altogether too many people have not accepted the result and not accepted that it is a national result. The the United Kingdom took a decision together and I appreciate the different nations and parts of the UK voted in different ways. But I had always hoped that the nation would take a collective decision together and go forward boldly and united towards a future uh, we could be proud of. Now, it seems to me that just as the European Union set out in that sort of now infamous stair-step slide, if you accept the implications of a vote to leave, then we need to be in a relationship similar to that of Canada or Japan, obviously closer because we're immediate neighbours. So obviously, having a land border, we would have additional customs facilitations. But I think that too many people have not faced up to the reality that that is the implication of the red lines of choosing to leave and be autonomous. So I hope that answers your question. But to be specifically specific about the consultation, I mean, I sat myself in 
the Cabinet Room with the Prime Minister meeting uh, Scottish and uh, Welsh ministers. And the Prime Minister certainly personally was engaging with them. Uh, I was responsible for English regional engagement, my colleague Robin Walker for the other nations of the UK. And he certainly was travelling frequently and engaging with people. But I hope you'll forgive me saying it's very difficult to engage with someone constructively on how we should leave the European Union if they're determined that we ought not to. But do you recognise the kind of cards close to the chest, which was a phrase Absolutely. used in Parliament frequently, meant that not just Welsh or Scottish Government felt cut out of it, that actually members in the House felt cut out of it members until of suddenly it appeared? It's absolutely clear to me that ministers in the Department for Exiting the European Union felt cut out of the process of negotiating our exit. That's why two Secretaries of State have resigned. So, uh, Grant Davis. Yes, I'm Chair. Um, and also, of course, you're f uh, a Member of Parliament for Swansea. I am, yeah, yeah. Member of Parliament for Swansea, uh, that's right. And, and incidentally, um, Swansea overall voted to leave, but I've got to say, uh, a lot of people in Swansea voted to leave are, are coming to me and saying, look, I voted you know, for more money, more trade, control of immigration, control of our laws, and they're saying that what's coming out of the, of the machine looks like we'll have less money in terms of divorce bill, less trade, uh, and less control, um, and therefore they want a final say on whether the deal that's on the table, or will be on the table, uh, actually represents what they voted for, and if it doesn't, they want to stay where they are. I'd like to comment on that, but also to comment on the, the, the point that you specifically made, that you claim that people want to basically control our rules and our parliament as the fundamental driver as opposed to these other economic ones which are a concern to people. And, and in particular, um, insofar as your vision would be to leave on WTO rules, be it in a managed way, uh, wouldn't you accept that that would basically be a system in which we'd have, a, be, have rules set by a council of ministers where we'd have less, say, 160 members, a uh, simple majority, some of them dictatorships, uh, it, implemented by a commission where we'd have less appointees and enforced by a panel of judges which aren't democratically elected, uh, that you know provide for you know having uh, less um, I don't know, less state intervention and various other rules and so how, how could you deliver your promise of uh, you know more control of our parliament under the WTO which was a less democratic and more sort of um, you know rule governed system. Well, thank you, Mr. Davies. I think you've asked me three questions: one about the second referendum, one about the fundamental driver, and a third about the. WTO, if I, if I may. So I, I wouldn't pretend to know the opinion of your constituents, of course. Um, but if I look at it, I mean, I, I, I think that we will continue to flourish. And not only that, that our being in or out of the European Union, taken alone, will not make much difference to our growth. If I can read you a quote from an Open Europe report, they wrote, our conclusion was that we can see no relationship between the cold numbers of our economic analysis, which are in line with other comparable studies, and the rhetoric of those who argue that Brexit will make a dramatic difference to Britain's growth trajectory in either a negative or positive direction. Like the Treasury. Now, now of, well, of course, there are forecasts on either side of the argument. Economists for free trade are at the top end, and others much more negative, and it's a matter over which people are uh, considerably divided. The Treasury's forecasts I'm happy to answer questions on, um, but... What I would say is that CGE analysis does not represent the full evolution of an economy, and it doesn't claim to. But what I think people want is a system where power answers to them. Mm. Where, you know, I'm glad we agree, but you know, I think that if we were to zoom out and look at Europe, I think we're in the midst of a grand crisis of political economy. And I don't think anyone can seriously, objectively say that is wrong. You only need me to name the countries for us to agree that there is a problem. In France, we've got the problem of the sometimes the streets on fire. Italy, we've got the problem of a, a radical left, radical right coalition. In Austria, a so-called Freedom Party is in coalition. In Germany and the Netherlands, far-right parties are being kept out by grand coalitions for that purpose. It goes on. Even liberal Sweden has flirted with the far-right. 70% of the vote in Hungary is for populist parties. In fact, there's a very helpful chart by 
um, Tony Blair's Institute, which indicates populism in Europe, we seem to have the lowest levels of populism, notwithstanding voting to leave. So I think if you look at all of Europe, I could talk about QE as well, I think we're in the midst of a profound crisis of political economy. That crisis needs to be solved, and I think that one of the ways you solve it is you take back democratic control of our laws. And yes, people will want more money into our public services, of course they do. And people want to have more free trade, and I believe we can deliver it. But people, I think, want their politicians to answer to them, and I don't think the way to solve that is to push the question back to them with all of the division and despair that would solve, as a so rather, Amongst those people who would say, we've told you once, we're telling you again, take back control. So I absolutely do not support having a further referendum. Could, could I, well, on could, the WTO just, point. Just, just a minute. Yeah, of course. Um, Duran, uh, let me finish that point. So yeah. that, I think, is where I would want to leave that. I absolutely do not support a second referendum. I think it's a terrible idea. I think, in fact, the first time round, I uh, overestimated people's willingness to accept the result. And I think the idea that we, we would ask again and have people accept it is for the birds. I think it's a terrible idea. So I, th I think I've probably, in the midst of what I've said, dealt with the fundamental driver point. On the WTO, I, I don't accept your caricature of how the WTO works. Um, it works overwhelmingly by consensus. It also does not have a Supreme Court which rules over our country with extremely broad scope. Uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't have a set of institutions comparable that, to that of a nation state. It doesn't have an ambition to political integration. It works very differently. Um, and I, I just simply don't accept your characterisation. I also think, if I may, Sir William, you, you, yeah. you, 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 you said my ambition to leave on WTO terms. That is not my ambition. My ambition is to leave into an advanced free trade agreement with security cooperation and all those other things which President Tusk offered us but I'm not afraid to leave on WTO terms, which are I, the underpinning of the world trade system. I, one question I'd just like to follow up on, you refer to the control of laws, you also look at the uh, situation in different countries, you mentioned Italy, you mentioned uh, the position in Sweden and in Hungary and the rest, um, and in France, uh, the yellow vest movement and so on, but of course actually a lot of this is associated, is it not, and I'll ask you to tell me whether you think this is the case, with the fact that the uh, fiscal compact, uh, which was imposed, uh, which David Cameron, to his credit, refused to join in on, and the checks too at that time, uh, which is conceived by, largely and led by Germany for the purposes of making sure that they have control over the ultimate laws of Europe, raises the very question that you were looking at, because if the consequences am I right, uh, of having the law-making arrangement like the fiscal compact actually has an effect of imposing austerity by law on those countries, well, naturally, they're going to say we want our laws back. Is that not part of the, uh, the Absolutely. I, of course, Sir William, I would agree with your analysis, of course, as you would expect. I just wonder, it. no, but it, I think it's important that you arrive at your own conclusions about that, and I'm interested to know whether you think that that is the right way to assess it. I have arrived at my own conclusions about that, Sir William, and I think if anybody wanted to validate that, they would look at my website and they would see blog posts going back to 2007, before yes. I was even a candidate, and they would see how my thinking... I've left it there, it's public, it's available, it's stevebaker.info if anybody wants to look at it. I doubt the server will crash. No, there I've we are. That. But, you know, there are plenty of blog posts about my thinking on the European yeah. Union, plenty of writing on the internet. I've reached my own conclusions, and, and I certainly yet. agree with you. Yeah. I think it's profoundly dangerous to impose things like a fiscal compact on populations in a way which denies a public, the public a, a, a meaningful say over how they're governed. I see. Now, c governments might make foolish decisions to overspend, but the public should have the opportunity to choose foolish governments or not. Richard Drax. We can't influence the decisions made here. But if I may, sir, I mean, look, I sometimes look at the Scottish National Party with some sympathy despite being a unionist because I believe in democratic self government. And I don't mind that you had a referendum, but the public in Scotland, as you know, with some, no doubt, discomfort voted to stay in the UK but you know we had a referendum and that's what they decided but yes of course I can see you you can legitimately object to the way the UK is constructed but you had a referendum 
and we'll be looking for another. Anyway, uh, Mr. Jacks, please. Uh, Mr. Baker, good afternoon. Uh, the questions you were asked this afternoon has um, had this process negotiation have an impact on public confidence at the first and then the democracy of our country. The second one is, could or should the government have done more to inform and explain to the public what it was up to? Yes, you're right. Your evidence to us so far uh, confirms what I already, I think most of us knew. <clears throat> In my humble opinion, I think it's devastating, your evidence today, that the government uh, almost complicitly, uh, our own government, I hasten to add, complicitly has tried to thwart the will of the people either directly or indirectly and not least by not informing its own department who was charged with getting us out of the EU in what it was doing. Would you agree with me, Mr Baker, that the question in or out was a very simple one? And I'm just a very simple ex-soldier. So to me, you either stay in the EU or you leave it. It wasn't about deals or economies. Yes, these are factors, of course. But in my humble opinion, and I'd be interested to hear yours, government and others have thrown these factors that were not in the debate into it, intentionally to confuse and ultimately, in some cases, to stop it. So my question to you is, do you think that is the case? And my second question to you is, how complicit in this effort to prevent Brexit from your very, very damning evidence were people like Mr. Robbins and Mr. Barwell, who we've, Mr. Robbins we've had here, who in effect didn't answer our questions, but you know him better than we do. And Mr. Barwell, we know, is an arch Remainer, who is very close to the Prime Minister, and we hear very uh, good evidence that his advice has very much influenced her thinking. I'd be most grateful if you could illuminate us on both those points. Um, well, Mr Drax, I do think that the government should have done much more to communicate positively about Brexit. In fact, one of the points in the communication strategy paper I wrote shortly after arriving was that the government should be campaigning for government policy. And indeed, there is now a campaigns.gov.uk website. It's only taken them over a year to set it up, but it's now campaigning, of course, to the wrong things, but by the by. Um, but yes, certainly government should have been doing much more to embrace the result and to communicate it uh, di directly. I'm, I'm very reluctant to directly attack uh, either special advisers or officials, because in the end, ministers do decide. I think there's a great, another great conversation to be had here. Do, do officials govern or do elected politicians and ministers? Well, I think everybody here will have watched Yes, Minister, and I think we need sometimes to remember that the old joke is it's a documentary, not a comedy. Now, that is not to say that officials aren't responsive to ministers. Actually, I was incredibly impressed by Dexu officials, far beyond my expectations. They were wonderful professionals, responsive to what I decided, and it was a joy to work with them. But the problem is that was in my area of legislation and domestic preparedness. But my direct experience of ministers deciding one thing to leave on an FTA basis, the EU offering us that basis, and then officials working through the Cabinet Office Europe unit to the Prime Minister to deliver something else. I'm afraid that has profoundly undermined my trust in the way the system works. But it would be wrong, it really would be wrong for me to sit here and be critical of Mr Robbins. I, I think I only met him once or possibly twice um, because he is in the end answerable to the Prime Minister and if the Prime Minister were to give direct instructions on policy they would be carried out professionally by him. I've, of that I have no doubt whatsoever. I think when it comes to special advisers one has to be extremely careful as an elected politician. Um, I previously did make some comment to the newspapers and I feel sure, and completely unrelated, uh, um, uh, with, a, with, with absolutely no relation to that whatsoever, I found myself uh, subject to a number of smear stories in the newspapers about a week later. But um, I feel sure that was nothing to do with my previous comments. And, uh, and just quickly, mere coincidence. But I'm rather reluctant to, therefore, yeah, I, be I too critical. I understand and respect that. Finally, can I ask a quick question? If this had all been handled very differently and more positively, do you think now? we would be in a very, very different situation with the EU. Yes, we would. Imagine that Dexu Minister's decision had been taken, accepted and carried out, and that a few weeks later the EU offers us a matching offer and we had sincerely tried to deliver it. My goodness, how 
different it would look. Because we might have carried Parliament with us that there was a clear, constructive, deep and special partnership being developed on the basis of our independence, our separate and equal status amongst the nations of the world, perhaps you might say. (coughs) And my goodness, it would have been different. But we need to rescue that position from now, which is why, of course, as you'll know, I've been working on what we're now calling the Morehouse Compromise. But that's that's perhaps a subject for later. But uh, we need to rescue the situation. I still believe we can be an independent nation and uh, get out of the EU successfully. But I would just implore the government to take seriously (coughs) delivering independence. And that means not having a triple lock into the institutions of the EU through the implementation period, through the current backstop, and through a future relationship built on the backstop. Those three things are a triple lock holding us in. It's a mistake to pursue that policy, and it must change. Uh, Michael Tomlinson, we're then moving on to another subject now. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr Baker. Um, Staying on the theme of communication, um, I want to ask you, please, about the media and media coverage. Um, I want to ask your view on the quality of the coverage and as to whether it's been, um, in your opinion, fair and balanced. But separately, um, and perhaps as a supplementary to that, um, what could or should the government have done in response to that coverage, in your opinion? <laughs> Great. Well, again, back to the first paper. I, w- I must go back and read it. The first paper I wrote seriously was about um, the government's communication strategy and what should be done differently, and I think I ought to go back and read it and make sure that I can communicate to the committee some of the suggestions I was making even within the first few months. Well, perhaps you would send us a copy. Mm. Uh, If I am able to obtain a copy from the department, Sir William, I certainly will, um, but I'm not sure I'm able to do that and will have to check. But I certainly will take notes and communicate to to you the gist. I'm very conscious, Mr Tomlinson, when looking at the media, that there are, as somebody once told me, basically five categories of story which sell. Mm. Scandal, danger to the community, human interest, novelty and the sport. Mm. So a good news story about how the Prime Minister is repealing the European Communities Act or how... (laughs) how we're going to end the saving of its effects at the end of the IP. These things are very difficult to communicate. More practically, it's very difficult to get a front-page story saying that Eurotunnel, Calais and Dover will all be ready for exit day in March and there won't be any delays to freight traffic. It's difficult to get that onto the front pages because it's not a scandal and it's not a danger to the community. But But if if Do you believe that to be the case? Sorry? Do you believe that to be the case? What, that they will be ready? Yes, yes, absolutely. They've announced it in public, yeah. Um, but we still don't see that on the front pages. You just won't. So, so in answering your question about fair and balanced, I think that the media is what it is. It's bound to carry stories of that category and not the, the good news ones we would want. Yeah. But to really uh, answer your question directly about the response, the government should have been putting up ministers much, much more often. The government almost seems, then and now, afraid to put up ministers in rebuttal. As you know what I'm like, I'm sure. I would have been, I was chomping at the bit to get out there. And particularly now we've been into full-on project fear. Mm. Every time there's a big scare story, ministers should be in the media rebutting it and saying, no, actually, Calais will be ready. We will adopt a policy of continuity because risk will not have changed on day one after Brexit and therefore we will not need new checks on day one after Brexit and therefore Calais will not have any delays to freight traffic coming in. No, don't worry about Calais on that closed loop because here's the long list of things which Calais are doing. There will not be a problem. The customs facilitation that that were recently announced should have been announced a long time ago. But as I I said in earlier evidence, I was imploring government to make public our no-deal preparations and it was prevented. I was told we could start after the December Council and it didn't happen. I was told we'd do it after the March Council, and I very nearly resigned in protest at not being allowed to start That's nearly after a year the March. Ago. Indeed, Sir William. You might remember there was a front page Telegraph story about having a new cabinet minister for No Deal back in the, I think it was in January, I'd have to go back and check. There was a, but you may remember a front page story and some considerable fuss about having a member of the cabinet for No Deal, which was reported to be me. Three sources tell me that it was a true story, it had been briefed out. And then, of course, it did not happen. Now, I'm not bitter about that. I don't mind not having served in the Cabinet. I wouldn't have minded if it was somebody else. But the fact remains, that story was on the front page, and I understand it to be true, and somebody blocked it. Why did they block it? Because they didn't want to upset the European Union. And back we come to the heart of the matter, Mr Tomlinson. The government has constantly been in this posture of craven supplication, refusing to answer criticisms levelled at it in a proper manner, refusing to debunk scare stories, 
and it, and it has left this country in the state of anxiety it's in. So I would say what the government should have been doing far sooner is making clear that no deal preparations were in progress, putting ministers up to debunk scare stories, being far clearer in announcing successes, making a, finding a reason to make a fuss about successes as they came up, things like Euratom being dealt with. So you know, the government, I'm afraid, has in many ways not merely failed, but deliberately failed to communicate. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, maybe that others want to pick up, but just yeah. a, ver a very brief supplementary. Well, I Richard Jackson. I, I, in which case, I'll just leave it here. Um, in, in terms of media coverage, shortly after your resignation, I saw the striking phrase, Potemkin structure. And, and Chairman, given your knowledge of history, you'll know all about Catherine the Great's lover, but I had to look it up. Um, it's quite a striking phrase. What, why, it just one? Why, why, why did you use it? What, why did you use it? Because Dexu contained leave-leaning ministers who could have had a leave-leaning attitude to the negotiation, which would have been considerably more robust than the one that has been taken. Mm. But actually, we were there to disguise the reality that the negotiation, its tone and its substance, was being driven by others. Mm. I'm quite sure that I was expected in government to fold, to hold on to my nice corner office on Whitehall and Downing Street, and my red box and all the rest of it, and fold and not stand up for what I believe is in the best interest of this country. It, was, it, it has for too, too often been used as a Potemkin to make it look like we're serious about leaving the European Union, when actually the policy has been to cling on to as much of it as possible. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Drabs. Um, just a very quick point, Mr. Baker. Having worked for the BBC <coughs> as a reporter for 10 years and know a little bit about its internal structure, it has a charter to be fair and balanced. Now, I've listened over the last eight years to the BBC, and I find it totally biased and unbalanced, and there's no doubt about that, and the statistics prove it. What did your department do to try and redress that balance? Because you say the story about the Calais port would never uh, reach the front pages, maybe not on the, uh, the local tabloids, certainly the national tabloids, but in the BBC, mm. it should have been top and foremost to counter the Remainers who were trying to operate Project Fear. So what did your department do to try and counter the bias of the BBC? Mr Drax, I hope you'll forgive me if I say I'm not trying to duck your question, but that would really be a question probably for our media special advisers and, uh, uh, and possibly the Secretary of State. But uh, I, I was not responsible directly for our communication strategy, so I, I, I can't answer but were that. Were you outraged at the coverage by the BBC? You were in the ministry. <laughs> you must have seen it and heard it, like me. Must have been furious with the coverage you were getting from the BBC, surely? I'm generally furious with the coverage which has taken place, not least because I'm quite sure that some campaigns to overturn the, refer uh, the referendum result have had a deliberate strategy of demoralisation, and I think it is quite despicable that people should set out to demoralise the public in their millions, um, but I don't doubt that it, it has been done. I think the BBC strives mightily to be impartial, as the civil service does, but also uh, people do have groupthink and there are few enthusiasts for Brexit. I, 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 uh, tempted as I am to give you a strident line of criticism of the BBC, uh, you I, have I'm already. not... Pardon? You have already, thank you. Thank you, Mr Jackson. Right, Kelvin Hopkins, then, please. A component of the bias in the media, and particularly, I have to say, the BBC, is the almost complete absence of putting a socialist case for leaving the EU. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, is, it is quite appalling. If one goes back into history, trenchant opponents of the common market in the EU, Clement Attlee, Hugh Gatesville, Michael Foote, Peter Shaw, Barbara Castle, Brian Gould, Tony Benn, Bob Crow, all of whom were Jeremy splendid Gould. socialist politicians. Sorry? Jeremy Gould, yeah. uh, Jeremy, well, I, 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 I leave <laughs> our, our leader to his own views. But these, these are people who have a history. This is where the party was. I wouldn't expect you to defend the socialist position, quite obviously. But nevertheless, there is a socialist case which can be completely ignored. Would you agree that one of the things that the media has tried to do is portray opponents of the EU as extremely right-wing and sometimes racist? Well, Mr Hopkins, you're my new favourite member of the committee. But yes, that is certainly true. And indeed, in the House of Commons, we've been painted as far right. And as I've repeatedly said, I consider myself an old English classical liberal. Mm. I'm profoundly committed, not least because of my faith, to the equality of every person. Mm. Moral, political, legal equality. And their liberty, the dignity of the individual and their freedom. That's what I'm committed to in my life and in my politics. And so I absolutely agree with you that that aspect has been, again, despicable. The caricatures and the propaganda have been despicable. 
And you and I, of course, in the past have often formed allegiances in this cause. And I'm conscious that left and free market right and socialist left have often formed allegiance and allegiances in the course of this journey. But it's always been founded, I think, on the same common ground. As a, 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 that common ground is a great faith in the people of this country and their capacity to choose their government. So yes, I think the Labour Leave case should be made and made more strongly, more often. And I certainly think that people should not engage in mere smears. Too often I've been smeared so many times it's now water off a duck's back. But people engage in mere smears rather than serious argument. And I think that they are failing our country profoundly when they do it. And I, I agree with what you've said. Thank you. So um, David Jones, please. Yes, to, to return and to, um, if you like, your experience of the department as a potential structure. Um, shortly after your uh, resignation, you appeared on BBC Daily Politics. I did. And you uh, told the interviewer that uh, you felt that the department, Dexu, had been blindsided and had been out of the loop. Uh, I, I would guess from the evidence that you've given so far that you believe that that was a deliberate exercise. But in, in what respects would you say that the department was blindsided? So if I may, could I take it a slightly different tack to start with? The where, where it was not blindsided, in my personal responsibilities of the legislation and domestic preparedness, I'm absolutely clear that the civil service functioned as it should, governments functioned as it should. I pulled levers and the response was as it should be in all of those areas related to legislation and domestic preparedness. I'm very, very clear about that. But where we were cut out was the negotiating strategy. Because you and I, David Davis, Martin Callanan, Suella Braverman, you know, we are all Brexiteers who want freedom for the United Kingdom, independence, and take a considerably different stance to that of number 10. So the number 10 has consistently sought to cling on, have as little Brexit as possible in a sense. So that's why I think where I think we were at Potemkin. And you, when I, I've reread I re um, David Davis' evidence to this committee before I came on, and I think his evidence bears out exactly the same story. Feeling, uh, being able to evidence, not really feeling, being able to evidence being cut out of policy making on a profound level. Now you refer to number 10, which is of course a building on Downing Street. Yes. Um, presumably you're referring to individuals inside number 10. Um, are you referring to career civil servants there, or are you referring to political advisers there, or who are you referring to there? Ultimately, of course, the responsibility for the position and the policy is the Prime Minister's. Yes. And I have no doubt whatsoever that everyone involved who works in that building is doing what they think best in the national interest. So I mean no slight to them. But of course, the way the system works is that the power is in number 10. The whole civil service looks upwards, as I feel sure those here who've, who've been in government will know. I mean, the civil service sees the minister as a client, but the ultimate client is, of course, the prime minister. So everyone looks upwards rather than outwards to the public. It's something else which I would change. So, um, yes, when I, when I refer to number 10, I, I mean that nexus of the Cabinet Office Europe unit, the Prime Minister's special advisers, and the Prime Minister herself. Who is in charge of that nexus, by the way? Um, I think the most important uh, people within this nexus have been um, Mr Robbins, Mr Barwell, and probably the uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Mr Livington. So when you refer to being kept out of the loop, blindsided, are you referring to uh, those individuals as the people who are responsible for the blindsiding and keeping out of the loop? Um, yes. So <laughs> politics is, of course, a battle of wills. And I think that within government, then as now, there is a battle of wills between the policy of those who actually hold the pen, as they say, on our Europe policy and those who would like to leave. I, I, you know, I, I, I often saw efforts to persuade me. There was one notable incident where I was asked uh, to produce a video for the Sunday Politics explaining the new customs partnership. And I, I knew at the time, I knew at the time they were trying to co-opt me into seeming to approve the new customs partnership. And I very, very carefully 
chose what I said and how I said it and my intonation, perhaps as BBC journalists do, to make sure that people understood I did not approve of the new customer partnership. So they, it, that battle of wills included tricks like that, trying to get me on TV supporting a policy which they knew I didn't support. Again. But I, I must say, it's a, an extraordinarily Machiavellian exercise mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. uh, for people at the head of government to set up a Department of State, a completely new Department of State, as, if you like, a sham that is designed to conceal what the true aim of those individuals or the, of the people at the top of government is, which is something totally different from the remit of the department. Let's be absolutely clear. In the areas for which I was directly responsible, government functioned as normal. And I was highly satisfied with the officials who worked for me and the mechanisms by which it worked. But in relation to the negotiation, it is very clear to me, and it's very clear, I think, objectively to anyone looking at the evidence of multiple resignations and what multiple ministers have said, that in relation to the negotiation, that the machinery of government has not worked as it should. That the centre checkers, the debacle of checkers, the way that secretaries of state were whipped, if I'd say so humiliated with that story about the taxi cards and so forth, that was not the way that decent and civilised cabinet collective government should work. Indeed, but, but y y your suggestion is that this was a deliberate exercise, a deliberate, to repeat, Machiavellian well, exercise. Well, of course it is. Thank you. Absolutely, of course it is. We, we took one decision in the department as all the ministers together, and a different policy emerged at Chequers. It was very deliberate. C can I just say, for the record, obviously I worked in the same department, I just want to echo what you've said, uh, in that I have nothing but admiration for the officials of Dexu, who I think were extremely dedicated, extraordinarily talented and extremely hard-working. Um, I just wanted to put that on the record myself. Th thank you for that. You're most welcome. Philippa. Obviously, the last two Secretaries of State have been very openly cut out of negotiations, but David Davis, the original Secretary of State, was not, and obviously had the opportunity to be directly involved and to be present in Brussels at negotiations. Do you think that there would have been some scope for him to have taken more of a grip of that uh, in that early phase before Chequers grew? Or do you think that there was digging away underneath the whole time. I've no criticisms of David Davis, far be it from me. Great admiration for David Davis and I enjoyed working for him and I now sometimes enjoy working with him. Um, but David has given you evidence on his relations with the Prime Minister and the negotiations and having read it carefully I recognise in his evidence my own experience and indeed the, the elements where I shared in his experience. So, I certainly would support the accuracy of, of his testimony to you. You always look back on what you've done and think you could have done more. It's certainly my intention throughout the whole of this process to look back and be confident I did everything I could possibly have done with the foresight that I had at the time. So, and I feel sure David Davis would feel the same. Certainly in his resignation letter, he set out some of the objections he'd made to policy at the time. But if you won't stand up, if you walk into the negotiating room thinking you're going to only ask what you know they'll give you, which has been our approach, well, of course, you're on the road to capitulation. And that, I'm afraid, is what has happened. But it's not the approach David Davis would have taken. And actually, I think um, he, did as, he did well to stay in government as long as he did. And he received external criticism for not being more active and more <coughs> engaged and therefore people being able to go off to Brussels representing the United Kingdom without him. Um, obviously, we did not particularly discuss that with him. Do you think that's merited, or do you think that...? I think it's not merited, and for a very straightforward reason. In the last few days, as people can read, I think, in the press, there's been conversation about whether the, 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 the current negotiating team should become more political. And I understand from a conversation, which I, I'm afraid I can't evidence Sir William, but I will tell you that I understand that the pushback has been that um, this negotiation is being conducted by officials. And it's officials on their side, so it must be officials on our side. Well, again, who governs? And I think we, should, we need to get, in our, in our country as a whole, we need to ensure that policy is 
we always need advice. We need advice of the brilliant policy specialists that we have. But in the end, if, if power is going to be used in a way which meets with public consent, which is at the heart of this debacle over leaving the EU, then politicians must have the skills to deliver on the pledges they made and actually go and do it. So we do need to get more politicians into the negotiating team, but that will be resisted by those who wish to keep politicians uh, Craig, out of it. Could I just comment on that or ask you a question derived from a very important s s proposal or suggestion you just made? Because, of course, the European Union is not, through the European Commission, an elected body in the first place. Mm -hmm. So what you just said actually illustrates the nature of the problem, which is that we have here in Westminster and have for centuries had an evolving democratic system of government. But when you translate the question to the issue of the European Union, you're dealing with institutions which doesn't actually have a political uh, <coughs> persona. It isn't a government, although they claim to operate that and create and we know this as well as anybody as the European Scrutiny Committee because we receive the laws that are passed down through Section 2 of the European Communities Act 1972, which are made in a council of ministers behind closed doors, by consensus, without a transcript, and the proposals themselves are initiated by a European Commission. Could you comment on what you just said? mentioned in terms of the contrast. Yeah. So, Sir William, I've mentioned earlier that I think this is a profound crisis of political economy. I think we are living through a terminal crisis of technocracy, the idea that our lives should be managed by others. I think it's a system, I can evidence, that with economic data, with various literature, that prior to the First World War, the dominant political economy was classical liberalism. State spending was low, the state was limited, money was sound. But we had two wars of transformation, as it was put by a former communist called Burnham, writing a book called The Managerial Revolution, a brilliant book, written in the course of the Second World War, along with a panoply of other relevant literature. But the outworking after the Second World War was that the dominant political economy was what amounts to social democracy. But Burnham and others make the case that the, the centre ground became managerialism, whatever, whether it was fascism or communism or the Brit British managerialism or the New Deal... The, the new centre ground became government as big as you could get away with, taxation at its limits, sustained chronic deficit spending, and chronically inflationary easy money. And I have all the evidence with me, I'm happy to go on at some length. But that system of government, which has been sustained by debasing the currency for 40 years, and, and taking people's power away from them and handing it to officials, not least through the system of the European Union, I believe that that system today is in profound collapse because the system of money, the financial system, cannot sustain this, this overspending chronically for decades. Now, we've got to look after people, but we've got to get through this crisis. Now, I haven't time to put all that I think about this on the record, but to answer your question about the institutions and how they make decisions, I think this goes all the way back to Plato and the idea of the philosopher king. And the idea of the philosopher king now, as always, is wrong. It's time to hand power back to people and live honestly with an honest and decent politics which makes pledges it can keep and pays for them in a, in a moral way. Through right. Now, Karen Davis. Yeah. Well, going back to Earth, if I, if I may, um, and uh, the relationship with civil servants, did um, any civil servant simply say to you, look... Uh, if we're not in a customs union, uh, then there will have to, by definition, be a hard border in Northern Ireland. And if we are in a customs union, there'll be no control over Im immigration. And what did you say in response? Or were they too frightened to say the truth? I don't think you'll find anybody was ever frightened of me. Um, no uh, frightened of you. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm absolutely confident that my relationship, relations with civil servants were professional and... Uh, mm. Uh, and, and constructive and positive all the time. But I would just say, I mean, I, 
I hope you won't mind me saying when you say it's coming back to earth, I would say to anybody who doesn't want to engage with the arguments I just made based on data and ideas, what is your answer? Anyone watching this or on this committee, what is your answer I just wanted to, to answer the, the obvious crisis of political economy afflicting not just Europe but much of the world? No, no well, it certainly isn't the WTO and, and, and you know, giving so, uh, dictation. But, so, but I just want to ask a specific question. I, I do not have a... Somebody says, look, we're in the customs union... We can't control immigration. If we're not in the customs union, there'll be a hard border. It's simple stuff. How do you respond to that? Do we you had, say it's Project Fear again? We had many conversations about Ireland and the Irish border. And, uh, but, of course, I don't have a transcript of all those conversations. And insofar as they were recorded, I would have to go back to the department to go through my notes. But... Um, Leaving the European Union undoubtedly raises a, a wide range of administrative problems, but when it comes to the movement of people, well, we'll preserve the common travel area. When it comes to is there a border today, well, yes, there is. There's an excise border, a tax border, a currency border. So when you look forward and think, what about regulations and customs? Well, you have to just ask yourself the question, can these problems be solved with current technology and administration? And the answer to that question is yes. And I happen to be sitting here with a treaty which solves those problems. So the, the problem of the Irish border is a very interesting one, and it's a matter of debate which I'm not in a position to answer. The extent to which it's been constructed, which many people have said, in order to justify a high alignment Brexit. Every party, every party to this problem has insisted that there will be no hard border. Not yeah, but this is words. Well, I'm afraid we're politicians, we use words. There's two countries without a customs union, there will be a hard border. No, that's not true. Things will go back and forth, and they'll have different, you know... I'm sitting here with... ...standards and all the rest of it. It's just something that's asserted, which is clearly false. I think you need to explain what you mean by a hard border. I'm sitting here now with a treaty, which means the border in Ireland would be invisible and compliant, just as it is with with excise duties. Remember, if we were in a customs union, sorry, if we're outside the customs union, but in a free trade agreement with zero tariffs on all sectors, which is what the EU offered us, then there would be no customs duties to collect. You would have to make customs declarations, but you have to make interest at declarations today. So, albeit not on consumers going to and fro, but this, this, pro- this set of problems I undoubtedly are massively overblown. Um, And I am convinced if we can break through the ideological dogma that you have to have political integration in order to have free trade, if we were willing to engage with the solutions which, as I say, are in the treaty that's sitting here on this desk, then we can have an invisible and compliant border on the island of Ireland and be an independent country. Did any civil servant put to you that under the Good Friday Agreement there's a provision to have a, a referendum on the reunification of Ireland if uh, you know, there's a popular view that there should be one. And given that 58% of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain, and there's going to be this problem at the border, how, you know, some people say they can resolve it. I said, I think it's an intrinsic problem. But did anyone in civil service say there's a real risk here, Minister, of basically triggering a referendum, the reunification of Ireland, not to mention downstream the Scottish issue, and therefore the union is at peril? Nobody ever said to me the union was in peril, and I do not believe that the union is in peril. The union is not in peril, but the, the Good Friday Agreement will be upheld. I think, I, I think I can safely say that I am sure every Dexu minister at some point or another has said we will up, uh, uphold the Good Friday so Agreement. So you will. And, and, and we will. But having read it myself... We'll have a referendum on the reunification of Ireland, which is in the Good Friday, you, you'll be happy to have that. No, uh, that's, no with, that, with that, respect, that, I think we're now moving into the question of Northern Ireland itself as a whole. I'd rather be concentrated on these questions. I can confirm to the committee that I have read the Good Friday Agreement and I'm well aware of its provisions, but I don't think that those, the fact that those provisions are in there uh, means that, uh, 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 that, that our, the Brexit makes uh, the unification of Ireland um, necessarily more likely. I think that's a matter for the people of Ireland in, under the terms of the agreement. Um, but Lord Trimble launched one of the papers associated with our solu- solution to the Irish border, and no one surely has got more impeccable qualifications on this issue than him. And he stands with us on this set of solutions, and I'm afraid that's good enough for me. Right. Now, Andrew Lure, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, so you, you've already you've already stated. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have already stated that the uh, that the white paper uh, that was produced on the 12th of July. Um, uh, had already uh, had large elements of it produced and written before the checkers gathering took place. I did hear you say that, didn't I, earlier on? Um, I think we'd all have to go back and check the stra- trans- transcript. But I think what, what I would say to you is that it's very clear that David Davis was leading a process within the Department for Exiting the EU, which I participated in, of preparing our white paper, which corresponded to our policy choices. Yes. And that with five days' notice, I think, was his evidence to you, he was presented with a different white paper, which came out in Chequers. So yes. it's, it's very clear that the policy developed and presented at Chequers was uh, substantially different to our policy. And who, who, in your view, had put together and written those pre-agreed, pre-written, not agreed of checkers, but already pr- written and produced sections of, of that white paper? Sorry, you mean the, gov- the checkers white paper? Yeah. So the, the checkers paper, the, 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 the phrase they use is holding the pen. So the pen was held for the checkers white paper mm. by the Cabinet Office Europe unit and the Secretary of State uh, was uh, holding the pen for our version of the white paper. But, of course, the drafts were all produced by officials. It does raise the question, which I cannot answer, of whether officials, which would be very unfair on them, whether Mm. officials were serving two masters and producing different papers for different bosses. And if they were, which seems to me plausible, Mm. that would be quite wrong. So given that there were two versions, as you've already said... um, to what extent were you involved in the publication of one or both, or were you only involved in the writing and uh, preparation of one of them? Well, this is why I've used the phrase about a Potemkin structure. I was only involved in the Dexu white paper. Mm. So, um, and again, I should say, you know, it's led by the Secretary of State. I read mul- multiple drafts and commented on multiple drafts. It was led by the Secretary of State. Mm. But in his evidence to you, he explained how approaching checkers he was shown a different white paper. And, and when you and the Secretary of State were involved in producing that. While you were doing that, were you or did you at least feel that you were in accord with Number 10 and Number 10 were aware of what you were doing? Number 10 were aware of what we were doing, but I was aware of a conflict going on between us. I was aware of snatched sections of conversation about different uh, and perhaps conflicting work going on in the run-up. This is why I was able to say to you earlier in evidence that I was expecting to resign over Chequers in the run-up to Chequers, even though I hadn't seen the white paper, because I was aware. I was aware in the week or two before Chequers that this was going on Mm. and um, that there there was going to be a change of policy. So, yeah, snatched conversations gave me to understand. Gave you that idea. Great, thank you. Right, uh, Kelvin Hopkins... Yeah. Um, do you think, I mean, you spent some time in Dexia and indeed one of our colleagues here did as well. Um, do you think that Dexia was and perhaps still is too under resourced or understaffed to be fully effective? Now, in another uh, my select committee, which is another step that we raised, raised the concerns about the tightness of the civil service staffing levels in a number of departments. But is that the case with Dexia? And if, it's, if so, what impact do you think this had on the ways in which? negotiations with the EU have been conducted? So my experience within my sphere of responsibility Mm. was that we were adequately resourced. Mm. Um, Certainly everybody worked extremely hard, Mm. but I think um, that intensity of of work was largely driven by the difficulty of getting the EU Withdrawal Act through. Mm. And, um, you know, if Parliament tables a great many amendments, then there's a great deal of work for officials to do. And... uh, um, possibly we could have used uh, more, but on the legislative side, no, I certainly don't think we were under-resourced. I think the, the work level was not the product of a small number of staff, but rather the product of intense parliamentary scrutiny, uh, which of course is entirely legitimate. We could have added more officials, but people are specialists on their part of the bill, you know, and if mm. there's only so much you can disperse that, that knowledge. So, um, 
On turning to policy and delivery coordination, what outstanding people, and I do want to say young people because the average age of Dexu civil servants is lower, really aspiring people making a career for themselves. It feels like Dexu has attracted the brightest and the best because they know this is the moment for our country <coughs> where things change. And people have been willing to take something of a risk in their careers to join Dexu, a time-limited department, we hope. So, um, PDC, I think, work extremely hard. Places can be difficult to fill because it, in a high stress, it's necessarily, it's Dexu. It's, this is stressful for the whole country. So some, some jobs can, can be um, uh, uh, difficult to fill there. I'm reluctant to say that De the PDC is, is understaffed. Um, they're doing an absolutely extraordinary job. They're trying to coordinate over 300 programmes across all of government. And they are, the innovations they're bringing forward in project management and coordination are a joy to behold. So I don't think it's held them back. But in terms of the impact on the negotiations, I think what I would say is that most of my officials were not working on the negotiations. They were working on UK-facing aspects. So some of my PDC staff would provide input into policy areas. But um, the negotiation coordination unit did not answer to me. Um, just broadening out the question, um, so, um, like you, I have a high regard both for civil servants and the job they do, but also the principle of the civil service and the way they can serve governments of different political persuasions and immediately adjust. And indeed, when I was a student over 50 years ago now, one of our lecturers in economics, he was a former Treasury official, he said one of the great things about British civil service and the Treasury, if the policy changes, there's always a back room where somebody's been working on alternative policies and they could bring, here's one I made earlier, um, and, and um, devaluation 1967, for example, and that, that sort of thing. Um, so th they, they can do this. But given that civil servants can serve different people, they still are human beings with views or inclinations to views as well. Uh, and when there is a negotiation going on with um, the EU, would it not have been more sensible to have a tick? Could you manage ministers not have insisted that there was a, a relatively more balanced team of civil servants going over there? Perhaps some meant to your view, my view, and some led towards other views, um, so that you didn't see civil servants being led away into a, a, a position where we are now. What an interesting question. So I was always extremely careful not to inquire how people had voted in the referendum, not to inquire, not to pay any notice to any hints, yeah. to deliberately not notice. Because I think that when, with an impartial and objective civil service, one which aspires to impartiality and objectivity, it would be absolutely wrong for ministers to seem to inquire after people's either party affiliation or leave remain affiliation. So with that in mind, um, I don't know how one, since I think that propriety requires that one not ask the question, um, I don't know how we could have a leave remain balanced team leading negotiation. What I would say though is that one of the major aspects of our negotiation with the EU is of course trade. And my experience in government and the answer to my recent uh, parliamentary question tells me that our chief trade negotiation advisor, Crawford Faulkner, has been cut out of our chief trade negotiation. And that is a stupid mistake. We have great experts in government on trade policy. Julian Braithwaite, our UN... Uh, sorry, yes, he's our ambassador in Geneva, so it's UN plus WTO. Uh, and Crawford Faulkner, people with... Um, great expertise who should be intimately involved with our EU trade negotiation and they're not and it's crazy. Thank you. Right, could we now That's move on to uh, David Jones please? Yes, uh, returning to um, your experience with the officials in, in, in DEXU, um, uh, you've read David Davis's evidence so you will see that he uh, says that uh, it's difficult to make progress and in fact the expression he used was uh, it was like being in treacle. Um, is that an expression that you would recognise in, in relation to your own experience of officials at, uh, at Dexu? Well, I, I do recognise it, but I would not attribute it to any shortcoming of officials. The, the government system is, of course, huge. Uh, uh, it's, it's huge and it's most concerned to do the right thing. It's also most concerned to both present and manage every conceivable risk. <coughs> 
And I think uh, there's also huge issues of collective agreement, there is power struggles be between departments, all, all of those things which are well documented in, in public choice theory and elsewhere. Um, and, and, and I think the result of all of that is that government is a very slow and cumbersome beast, which is not to criticise the individuals, it's to say that, that government is categorically different to business, it is not profit seeking. Um, and it, it, government is able to look upwards to ministers and think it's succeeded when the minister is pleased with a paper. And it's important that ministers are pleased with papers, and I don't mean to diminish anybody's work in the, the enormous amounts of work which are put, put into producing subs to ministers, but actually that is not the product which my taxpayers and all of our taxpayers in our constituencies are, that's not what they're paying for. They want to be served in their lives. And so what I would say is that I think that there are really deep problems with the functioning of government, the state as a whole, which partly arise institutionally because it, it doesn't pursue profit and loss, it's not disciplined by profit and loss. And um, that's of course we start, I, start to, I start to depart from Mr Hopkins, I'm sure, on this point. But the state not being disciplined by profit and loss ends up serving ministers and seeking status and bigger budgets and um, ends up being very slothful and uh, uh, some wonderful books like The Blunders of Our Governments, setting out how things go wrong through you know, cultural misapprehensions and so forth. So yes, I absolutely recognise this idea that the system moves slowly, but that I don't wish to diminish any of the brilliant work that people do. Sometimes it moves very fast. Some of the work that's been done on software, for example, like the replacement for the traces system, which was rescued in the course of things. I, I think that, that, if I may, Chairman, just one further question. I think that you, like me, were responsible for overseeing the coordination of Brexit preparation across departments. Did you find that some departments were, were if you like, more treatly than other departments? Absolutely, of course. And some departments took different attitudes to their reporting than, than others. So one department in particular insisted on saying it had no capacity to deliver month after month. And I think it's uh, a matter of opinion, but fair comment to say that was part of their Treasury funding bid. Um, but it created an enormous amount of, of work. There was an interministerial group which I chaired to drill into why they kept reporting a lack of capacity and it wasn't improving. But then once they got their funding bid through the Treasury, miraculously their capacity dramatically improved. So all these, I'm afraid, these, these, these things go on in, in government as people struggle for, struggle for power and money. We're just coming towards the end and I wanted one more question, uh, Andrew Lua, relating to the question of uh, the law officer's opinion and the ministerial code. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so we know about the Attorney General situation. We know that the vote has taken place and the instruction was given to government to release the previously confidential advice of the Attorney General. <coughs> what this committee, and our chairman particularly, but others have said repeatedly, but doesn't seem to be cutting through as well as it should, is that that instruction was for all of the legal advice relating to the withdrawal agreement, rather than just the bit about the Northern Ireland backstop. So in that context, um, <coughs> Is there a case for arguing that despite ministerial code provisions regarding the confidentiality of legal advice given to ministers by law officers, the circumstances surrounding Brexit are so extraordinary that all legal advice from the law officers should be made public through the negotiation process? And, and in answering that question, the follow-up would be, do you see or what are any potential risks in making that information public for those involved in the negotiation process? And could I just add to that, of course, remember, if I may just add, uh, that the um, Attorney General was held in contempt and the government was held in contempt by a resolution of the House of Commons in relation to uh, the full legal advice in relation to the withdrawal agreement. So for practical purposes, uh, it's actually constrained by the resolution of the House of Commons. So the, on the point of the uh, government being held in contempt, I found myself thinking there, but for the grace of God, uh, go I, because of course we had leaks and humble address, this is plural, I think. The misery of being in minority government through this process is broad and deep both getting legislation through and what it means for our negotiation, for the power of the Prime Minister to deliver what she negotiates. 
And I think that the, the Attorney General not only was required to produce the advice, but was subsequently held in contempt because of our, our status as a minority government. But there's no, there's no point particularly raking over that. Given that the government was ordered, so ordered, to produce the advice, the government must produce the advice. It must produce all the advice which it's required to under the humble address. I'm absolutely clear about that. The, but it raises the question, is there further relevant advice within that hum, the scope of that humble address which was not produced? Now, I do not know. It is not information which I have whether there was additional advice on that. I did read some legal advice in particular relating to the sum of money owed. Yeah. So, division. Uh, but